So again, my name is Jason Church. Uh, I'm with the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training. We are located on Northwestern's campus in Natchitoches, Louisiana. And we are an office of the National Park Service. So we're a full National Park Service research unit. Uh, technically, we're considered a Washington office, uh, but located luckily here in uh, Louisiana. And we service the whole country. So we do things here and all over the United States. We travel a lot, do preservation work all over the, the country uh, and internationally. Uh, and of course, today we're just going to talk about work here in Louisiana or Preservation Louisiana. So what do we do? So NCPDD does a variety of things. We're broke up into different divisions, archaeology, collections, architecture, historic landscapes, um, all of these things, materials, conservation. So as you heard in my introduction, I'm the chief of technical services. So what we do is a variety of things. One of the things is we go out and actually help people do analysis. Uh, so for example, we're working right now at the Cooley House in Monroe uh, doing a paint analysis. So to figure out what the original paint scheme was for the whole house. Uh, so Dr. Cooper in this photograph will go take microscopic little samples, we'll put them under uh, magnification and figure out the original color scheme that the house was painted uh, for the Cooley House. So we can go out and do work for others. We're also a training center. Um, so we do workshops all over the country. I think I've missed three or four during quarantine that I was supposed to be teaching. Uh, and when it actually hit, I was running a field school um, with the HOPE project through the National Trust in Kalapapa, Hawaii, training University of Hawaii Hilo students on cemetery preservation. And so we do a lot of workshops, a lot of hands-on workshops like this. So for example, we're working here uh, on, on another National Trust HOPE project Chalmette National Cemetery in Chalmette, Louisiana. Uh, we had about 700 volunteers come through in a month and we trained them on how to clean and reset uh, headstones uh, at Chalmette National Cemetery. We're also a research center. So we have six research labs that we actually work in to develop techniques and to test products that are on the market. Uh, so for example, a Louisiana project, you recognize Fort Livingston, which is off of Grand Terre. During the BP oil spill, it was completely um, inundated with oil from the Gulf Coast. So we worked and uh, developed treatments and protocols for how to remove oil from historic masonry, uh, which is we're still working on now on different kinds of oil for pipelines because uh, of a very different kind of oil. So how do we remove that? So that's the kind of work we do uh, as a national park unit. And we're the only research office for cultural materials in the U.S. with the National Park Service, and we're luckily here in your state. So today we're going to talk a little bit about a project. Uh, I'm going to show you examples from the pilot and talk about how the project is expanding currently. So we started, this started last summer, almost a year ago, uh, getting, getting close to it, to document uh, what we saw as a lost cultural resource here in the state, uh, and that is uh, tenant farmer cabins, and we'll talk a little bit about what that is and the history of those cabins uh, and sort of what we're going with that. So the project was between NCPTT, um, I oversaw the project and I had two students helping me. One was from the University of Florida and one was from Ahmedabad University in India. So the three of us did the, the work that you're getting ready to see. Uh, and that was the pilot for the project in the fall, hopefully in September. Uh, we will continue the project on a national scale. So we're, we've got funding for a full year. We'll take this project and go on a national scale. Um, we're getting inquiries from all over the state of Louisiana, all the way up to Maryland, uh, West Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, uh, the whole South to come and document slave and tenant cabins in, that are still existing there. So kind of covering a little bit uh, of this talk, talking about uh, how we're doing the documentation and what we're using it for. So we started off with the project originally looking at tenant cabins. And one of the things that came up is a lot of people said, well, wait a minute, you're calling them tenant cabins. And we were thinking about that being the last use, but in fact, they were originally slave cabins. Not all, but the vast majority of the buildings we documented 
were actually originally slave cabins. So we sort of changed the focus to be both um, slave houses and tenant houses to talk about the full use of the buildings and some that were only tenant that were later. Uh, so we'll be traveling in the fall around the state. This is uh, Evergreen Plantation, uh, not far from here. Um, they have 22 original slave cabins, and these cabins were still occupied until about 1950. And when the current owners bought it in the 40s, um, they slowly moved out the people that were still living in there, and now they've just been uh, basically open for interpretation ever since. Uh, so we're going to do the documentation, and I'll show you in a minute, uh, on all 22 of those. So we have right now about 100 uh, around the state of Louisiana that people have already asked us to come and document. Um, and there'll be a little time in, in the end that I definitely want to hear from people if they have uh, existing slave cabins and tenant structures. Uh, we'd like to hear from them because that's how we're finding them to document is uh, once we find them, of course, we have to get permission and things like that. So we're, we're excited for people to come to us wanting us to document it. So why are we doing this? Why is it important? Uh, the reason is I'm not from Louisiana. I'm from the mountains of North Carolina and had never really heard of the tenant farming system. Uh, that's not something I grew up with or really had much knowledge about. And when we moved to Natchitoches 15 years ago now, I saw all these very small structures along the Cane River. And every few years, there would be less and less. There's probably half as many now as when I moved 15 years ago. And I just thought they were just these wonderful little vernacular houses and really had no idea what they were or the history behind them. And a lot of the people I asked, they also didn't know the history behind them. So as I started talking to people, I was learning the history of tenant farming and basically how that came into play and realizing this story was completely being lost. Um, we just now sort of opened up the stock to start talking about slavery, but you know the idea that that all ended at a certain point, and sort of this whole next story sort of gets washed over, and people don't want to talk about how long it really existed. So the basic gist is, you know, especially here in the Deep South, you had an agriculture-based economy. You had to have a large workforce. You know what we have now with things like. Uh, some of the plantations that you go to, for example, Oakland Plantation in Natchitoches, they have two slave tenant structures still still left. Well, there wouldn't have been two, but we go on the tour and we think, oh, okay, so they had two slaves and they lived in these little cabins. Great. What we don't realize is, no, there were 50, 100 of these. You had a very large workforce. So the interpretation is a little bit off, and the idea of the vast space and majority, whole neighborhoods of these things existed that are just gone. And they're gone more and more every day, so we really wanted to try to start capturing them. So this is a good example. This is one of the few pictures we found that really shows the, the breadth of what was there. This is my only picture that's not in Louisiana. This is actually in Sel outside of Selma, Louis uh, Alabama. But you can see just how many of these structures were there. And of course, these are all gone now. So thinking of the Cane River area in Natchitoches, uh, it's estimated there were about 800 tenant cabins. Now that's not 800 people, that's 800 cabins. Uh, most of these had families of anywhere from four to 10 people. And now there is less than two dozen. So if we think about it, that's just one small window. If there were around 800 there, and now there's only about two dozen. And actually the reason we have so many is because of the National Park Service um, protecting the ones that they have. So outside of the two dozen, there's only, you know, about six that aren't, that are in private hands. So if we think about, that's a pretty small number considering how many there once were. So that's what really spurred this on to try to start documenting as many as we could right now, not waiting and saying, well, this is something we should talk about later. We want to start documenting them immediately. And this is the reason. So this is one that we were asked to document. We scanned it on a Thursday, I mean on a Tuesday, on Thursday it collapsed. So this isn't one of those, oh, in 10 years, no, tomorrow, this week, we're losing more. So for example, this is just a very small, these are very small buildings. Um, you know, this is about maybe 
maybe 400 square feet. And this one, we weren't able to get a very good scan because it is such a um, canopy of Virginia creeper across the back of it. And originally we said, well, we'd get a better scan if we took all the vinage off. And we realized the vinage was actually what was holding the building up. And you, when the wind would blow, you could actually see the building itself move. So we realized, okay, and luckily the scanning, uh, I'll, we're going to talk about it more in a second, is non-contact, so we're not touching the building, because uh, there would have been no way to have documented this building at all. Uh, and then we were told a few days later, hey, you should come back and see it. And when we went back, it didn't just fall over, it exploded. There were pieces of splintered wood 30 feet out into the yard. So when it went, it went. Uh, unfortunately, it was fully furnished. So all the original furniture, the table, the chairs, everything from the life of this structure was still in it. And that's what we find a lot. Really, the tenant farming system in the U.S., in, in the South, really lasted until the late 1960s, early 70s, depending on where you live. And what really replaced it was mechanization. All of a sudden, we didn't need that large labor force. We had you know, the plantation owner could buy a couple of combines or a couple of tractors and let half or more of his workforce go. And that's what happened. So we lost a lot of these structures in the 1970s. If you don't need 20 houses on your property and you can get another two acres of cotton in, you knock them down. You go ahead and you get rid of them. You've got more acreage to farm. Really, the ones that have survived are the ones that were used longer. Uh, talk to one plantation uh, here outside of Baton Rouge, and they've asked me to come. They have six original slave cabins. They've asked me to come document them. And they said, um, I said, well, you know, what's the condition of them? They said, oh, well, here, here's the address. Look on Google Earth. And I looked it up. And I said, There's a satellite dish and cars in the driveway. They said, yeah, they were lived in until 2016. Original building, not really modified. Uh, we have seen ones that still had no windows or doors that were lived in in the 90s. So we've, these aren't on the main roads, and people will, you know, argue, oh, that's not. No, there's no way people still lived in them. People are still living in them. So most of these were lost by neglect or demolished purposely for more acreage. So one of the things we're trying to accomplish to tell this story is also collecting firsthand accounts. Now, there's not a lot of books written. Um, you know, if you, if you have a large illiterate workforce, you don't have a lot of first-hand accounts written. It just doesn't exist. When we find them, we're very excited. We try to document them, you know, read everything we can. Uh, so this is a good example. So this is, um, this is a white family that were sharecroppers in most, mostly North Louisiana during the Great Depression. And in the Great Depression, we see a big shift of not only African-American uh, tenant farmers, but also white tenant farmers. Um, of course, this is one account of one family story. Um, and, and in that one, which is a great book, you can read it if you get a chance, um, they really talk about sort of the father moving the family around to different plantations constantly. They might only work in one plantation one year. Uh, we didn't make a lot of profit, and we think the profit will be better if we move to this one. We've heard people, we've met people that said, we'll get better pay on this one. So they move. Well, we heard the soil's better at this one, so we'll get more acreage. Um, so we move. Then you get, um, I don't know if anyone's seen the movie, uh, same kind of different as me. Should, I recommend reading the book if you get a chance. Uh, so Denver Moore is a tenant farmer. This book was written in the 90s. He was a tenant farmer in Red River Parish, so right above Natchitoches, uh, actually in Cushata. And he, his firsthand account is really amazing because he talks about the fact that as tenant farmers, they were totally cut off. They didn't know World War II happened. They didn't know Vietnam happened. They had no TV. No radio, no newspaper, totally sheltered and isolated, and you worked on the same farm that their families had worked on since the 1800s, and you never left. And the only reason he let, you know, I don't want to give anything away for the book. I do recommend you read it. Um, he essentially watches a train go by every day and says to heck with it one day, drops um, his hoe and jumps on the train and leaves. So he talks about 
And then in the book, he actually goes back in the 90s and visits his family that are still living in the same cabins with no water, no uh, windows, uh, no electricity, no plumbing. Uh, and that's the 1990s. So um, I love it. I, I've, I've given a similar talk to students at uh, Grambling and Tuskegee, and, and the students always, I see this look, and I, I'll go, now remember I said 1970s. 1980s. No. Oh, you know, we're not talking 1870s. We're talking 1970s. Um, this is another, if you get a chance, this book I highly, highly recommend. Um, this is Clifton Clark. He was a labor organizer, um, originally from uh, Louisiana, traveled all over the U.S., New York and other states, and decided that he saw the conditions worse in Louisiana than anywhere else, so he came back here and spent his career uh, trying to educate and start labor uh, movements in Louisiana for the tenant farmers to tell them in the 1930s and 40s what rights they had you know, through the government and, and uh, the ag extensions and things like that. Um, but he talks heavily about people who have been tenant farming on the same in the same house, in the same fields, since the mid-1800s, and they didn't know they could walk away. They're still living and still working. So tenant farming, for a lot of people, really became a form of economic slavery. So it really replaced the bonds uh, of actual slavery with just economic slavery. And one of the things that we talk about is, you know, in his book, in Clifton Clark's book, he talks about it's the only book I have found that actually talks about the pay and the salary. And he goes through each plantation that he stays at, and he talks about how much they get paid. And we, we sort of did the conversion of math, and we realized one of the plantations he was talking about, when you looked at how much they got paid weekly, minus they got a quart of milk, a gallon of milk, and pay. When you realize that, and we converted it from 18... I mean, 1940s money till current, the families were making about $1,400 a year. So in the 1940s, I mean, 1940s, $1,400 a year is not a lot. I mean, that's not even... Um, so that's when you realize that's why people couldn't leave. And another reason is it was eventually outlawed, but a lot of the plantations would pay you in token or script. So you would get paid, but you would get paid in money that could only be spent at that plantation. So one of the gentlemen I met uh, outside of Grambling who grew up as a tenant farmer, I uh, told me, he said, uh, one more bail. He said, that's what we were told our entire life until they kicked us off the plantation in 1968. We were told if we had harvested one more bail, we would have been out of debt. He said, my entire life I heard you to harvest it this year, one more bale, you'd have been out of debt. So the reality is how tenant, the tenant farming system worked is you got a section of the farm that was yours. You got housing and food and allowance that were paid out from the plantation owner. Um, so the plantation owner essentially said, hey, you know, everybody, you're free now. You don't... Uh, you know, you can go anywhere you want, but tell you what, I'll give you a job. You can do the same work you're doing for me. You can stay here in the same house, but I'm going to have to charge you rent now. And, you know, the clothes you're wearing and the furniture that's in your house, well, that was mine, but I'll let you have it for a small fee. And, you know, how I've been feeding you all these years, well, I'm still going to feed you, but I don't have to charge you for that now. And it's okay, because you're going to make money. But at the end of the year, I will take everything that you have, that you owe me, rent, clothing, food, and I'll subtract it from what you made, and I'll give you the difference. Well, the reality is there was very rarely ever a credit. So you were stuck in economic slavery. You had to keep working for them, because if you left, you could be arrested. You owed money to that plantation. So one of the ways around that was you got paid in coin that was only good at that plantation. And the reality is, um, we talked to a lot of people doing oral histories, things cost four or five times in the plantation store what they did anywhere else. But you couldn't go anywhere else because you only had money that was good there. So you then owed even more and more. 
And if you read Denver Moore's book, what he says, and it makes sense, he said, you know, but if you have an entire workforce that's illiterate, how do they know how much they really owe versus how much they really make? So every year we were told, you're a little short again. He said, but there would have been no way for us to ever know how much that was. So that's, one of the, that's why we want to do this project. We want to talk about sort of this tenant farming system. And like I said, it, it really existed until the late 1960s, uh, especially here in Louisiana, to document not only the buildings before they're lost, because we think those are really valuable cultural resources in themselves, uh, but also through oral histories and stories um, before we lose that last generation of tenant farmers. And we're, we're right on the edge of losing uh, that last group that were still actual farmers, not the children of, but the, the actual farmers. So the first way we're doing it is through laser scanning. Um, so we're a technology center, that's what we do. Uh, so we're doing 3D laser scanning of the buildings. So for our pilot project, we did 10 structures uh, there in Natchitoches, and there's a few more at Oakland, I mean at Magnolia Plantation, but that was pretty much it. Uh, that's all we could find. We, we've documented these, and I'll show you examples of a couple of them. So uh, the one uh, that's so wooded, that was the one that collapsed. Uh, and this is the only one that we found. Uh, someone has recently bought this and is going to preserve it, which we were really excited to see. And the problem is, one of the reasons that we wanted to document is as my deputy assistant director, Andy Farrell, always says, all buildings have to work for a living. You know, you have a 400 square foot building out in the middle of the field with no plumbing, no water, electricity. It's hard for us to argue to the landowner that you really need to preserve this building. Who's going to drop twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 into a building that no one wants to use for anything? Um, one of my favorite uh, aha moments I was uh, we did a project with Tuskegee Institute and I had a group of students out looking at one of these and we were teaching them about the laser scanning and one of the young ladies in the class we went in the house she came out and she said my closet back home is bigger than this house and then you're like yes so you, you have to realize what are you going to do with this building I mean yes we want to save it we want to preserve it for what so it's hard to, to argue that. So one of the things that we're trying to do is document as many as we can and hope that people want to save them, uh, and that would be amazing. And this one's a good, uh, we call this one Irene's Cabin because the last gentleman who lived in it until um, just a few years ago, if anyone visits uh, Melrose Plantation, this is right up the street. The guy used to sit on the porch and wave at everybody. Um, that's Irene. So he just passed away a few years ago. About four or five years ago. So someone's bought it and they're going to restore it. So yay, one's going to be saved. Um, so we do 3D models of them and then we process the software. We put, uh, we have to move the scanner around. We take lots and lots of images and then we have to go in the computer program and stitch them all back together into a single object. Uh, the scanning is pretty easy. Um, it, it's pretty, pretty much point and click. The, the fun part is the software putting them all back together. And you can sort of see how many scans uh, we're, we've done in this, uh, on that left column there, just to get this one back together. And that's just the exterior. The interior is even more scans. Um, it's pretty fun. Um, and then for right now, what we're doing is what we call a 3D walkthroughs. Uh, so we're producing these 3D walkthroughs so people can view them, walk through the house, see what it looks like.
so one of the bigger ones that we documented, it's three rooms with the front porch. Um, and the original structure is actually bousillage. So it's mud and it's a timber frame structure. Uh, so these are very early. Uh, they were slave cabins and then turned into tenant cabins until um, the early 70s. Mr. Shields, who grew up in this one, uh, lived in it until he joined the Army and went to Vietnam. Um, and you'll meet him later. We've done oral histories with him about living in them. And then another example, and I'll talk for a minute if anybody wants to look at that link. So these are the slave cabins at Magnolia. So the slave cabins at Magnolia were originally brick, uh, which is fantastic because they've survived so long. Uh, there were more of them, uh, historically, a tornado went right through the middle. And then also during uh, the Civil War, the main house at Magnolia was burned, and they rebuilt it using bricks from a series of the slave cabins. So they lost a chunk then, and then the tornado lost a chunk. So those are uh, all except for the one that is in that photograph. Uh, they're essentially duplexes. So you have two sides with a shared wall in the middle. So one family lived on each side. And they're about 10 foot by 12 foot. So imagine that's it. That's your whole family living in, uh, in that. Um, and that could be anywhere from you know, two people to 10 uh, living in each of those. So not very, very small. And I was at, I've been asked by several people, well, where were their kitchens? And of course, some people have asked us where their bathrooms were. Um, we know that answer. The reality is there were no kitchens um, because during slavery, the main house would have cooked the food. Uh, the slaves there would have also cooked the food for the workers and then brought them out. So, you know, when it was used later, your your cooking would have been done on that fireplace. Like I said, these were lived in. Uh, until the late 1960s. And one of the next uh, sort of goals of the project is to turn uh, the 3D models in import them into AutoCAD to produce architectural drawings as well. So we're doing lots of photography, we're doing uh, interior photography and exterior, we're doing the 3D modeling um, with the 3D laser scanning and also uh, working to produce architectural drawings of the original structures. Uh, again, before we lose them. So that sort of gives us the tangible heritage. So we're we're trying to work to preserve, uh, you know, these little vernacular architectural jewels before they're gone. Um, but the other part is the intangible. So it is still just a building. We want to know about the life and the times of that building, the people who lived in them. Uh, so in the same time, we're working to try to do as many oral histories as possible uh, and then to produce videos from that and hopefully in the future our videos won't have uh, Ed Huey's amazing harmonica playing in the background uh, they'll have someone talking about the house and their memories of them as the house uh, as you look at the house um, so this is Mr. Shields this is Elvin Shields he's been uh, one of our amazing um, Storytellers that has told us about what it's like living in, and like I said earlier, um, that cabin that he's standing on, that's where he grew up. Uh, so we've got a series of videos. Right now is when we were supposed to be doing a lot of interviews, but of course we can't. Uh, we can't travel and visit people in their homes, uh, especially a lot of the people that we've had lined up to interview were older. Uh, so hopefully in the fall we can uh, go back and start interviewing the people we had lined up. 
And hopefully by then, presentations like this will bring out more people who want to talk to us. So I'll give you just a, a snippet, a clip of uh, Mr. Shields talking. This is typical. You see that little girl there? She's about 13 years old. And normally, all these kids here would be in the cotton field, picking cotton. But this is not cotton picking time. This is probably cotton chopping time because these kids are too little to chop cotton. When you're about nine years old, you get to go chop cotton. And so what the families would do was take all their kids to one house, and these houses will act like nurseries. And each one of the mothers will probably come Saturday, give their little girl a quarter or 50 cent. Because not only that she's babysitting these children, she's also cooking their dinner. So she would just put one black skillet in the oven at a time to cook the cornbread. So when you came at lunch to pick up your children, you would pick up your cast iron cornbread, and then you would pick up your little pot, and you would go home with your cabbages, mustard greens, collard greens, beans, whatever that she was cooking. You know, you would have your lunch at your family house, and then you would come back in the afternoon, and you would bring her your things back with whatever you want her to take care of while she's there. She ran everything. So she had a restaurant going, she had a nursery going, and if any of these kids uh, required a spanking, she would do the recommendation. When all the parents come home to pick up their kids, uh, she would give a report. And basically the mothers would say, okay, 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 okay. And there were no question about her authority to recommend spankings. And here she's nine years old, and she recommend who gets a spanking. So, yeah, we're trying to get as many oral histories as we can before they're gone. Um, but, I mean, amazing stuff we wouldn't have known about. Um, I mean, I don't know how many of you have kids, but, you know, imagine a 13-year-old. She's watching all these kids. She's disciplining them. Uh, and she's cooking dinner for each of their families during the day. I mean, we're having a hard time getting the kids to put their laundry in the hamper. And she's running, like he said, a restaurant and a nursery uh, and getting paid a quarter or a day for it. Um, and, and he's talking about his life experiences, so we're thinking 1950s, 1960s. That's something I'll, I always want to keep everybody, you know. Another thing uh, we're doing, we want to do with these scans and documentation is, of course, accessibility. So if you're a researcher or just someone interested in history and you live you know, in Washington State or New York, you probably can't get down and find these things on the back road. Doesn't mean you can get in them or... So one of the things that we have been using this for is accessibility. Uh, not only for uh, handicap accessible, but just distance accessible. So people can view these structures uh, as they are. So one of the ones that we documented was uh, the folk artist Clementine Hunter, who was a very important folk artist uh, period, uh, very important in the state of Louisiana. But what, one of the things that makes Clementine's work so important is um, she really paints daily life. So we see things through her paintings that no one really was talking about. We see, you know, prayer meetings and hog killings and pecan picking and, you know, what it was like as, as a tenant farmer, and she was. So she grew up picking cotton as a tenant farmer. Uh, when she moved to Melrose, uh, this is her house here. Uh, she was a tenant farmer on Melrose. She lived in one of the tenant farmer cabins. And if you go to Melrose now, which I highly recommend, you'll see this fantastic preserved house that was hers, but it's really out of context. They have drug the house to right behind the big house. It never was there. It was only there the last few years. It was way in the back of the fields with dozens of other ones. Hers is the only one that survived because it was Clementine Hunter's house. It's someone famous's house, so it survived. All the rest are gone. There were rows of these houses, and we have the one because someone famous lived in it. So what we wanted to do, they've done an amazing job of reinterpreting it, putting her furniture back in it, her paintings, and trying to bring it back as much 
to what it was like when she lived there. So with Clementine's house, what we wanted to do was to combine both a 3D walkthrough to see how it is now, how it's done in the interpretation, uh, that APHN has done a great job of interpreting it um, with, like I said, with her furnishings and signage. But you not only can walk through the house now, so um, you know, a scholar or someone interested in her could do that, but also combining that with oral history. So this is Tommy Whitehead. Um, Clementine's official biographer uh, and patron. Um, and so we wanted to do walkthrough videos not only of the house as a 3D model in itself, but again to get the, the intangible heritage of what it was like when Clementine herself actually lived there. So when the interpretation plans were made for the house, we decided the best thing to do with the house was to tell the story of Clementine Hunter and the painting she did here. So we've taken themes. This one, the first room, the living room, is now the room that tells the story of work out here at the plantation. There are scenes, for example, here. There is hoeing cotton and picking cotton. And you might notice, too, the styles of these paintings vary. Her painting style varied as, well as did her signature over the years. And you can look, I can look at a painting and tell within a few years what year she painted it. So by doing oral histories with Tommy Whitehead, we can walk through room by room and talk about this was her living room, this is what she used it for, um, that sort of thing. So that's sort of how we're trying to capture not only the tangible but the intangible um, history of these structures, uh, not only the building itself and the workmanship that went into it, uh, one of the fun things that we found is almost all the buildings we have scanned, we have noticed that they're made out of recycled lumber. The boards are different lengths, they're different kinds of wood. We've seen stenciling from crates on them, we've seen graffiti on them that obviously wasn't put on the building when it was there because it's upside down or it's part of a word. So these are mostly have been kept up with recycled lumber and recycled materials as they had them as they were available. So not only to capture the house in great detail, but also to try to capture the, um, the history of the house and the people who lived in it as best we can. So, and that really takes you, um, people contacting us saying, hey, we know where this structure is, or hi, my great aunt would like to talk to you. By all means, drop me an email. Uh, this is how we're lining up people. Um, in the fall, we're going to start full-time traveling literally all over the country, um, looking at documenting structures and talking to the people about them. Finding, um, I was talking to one gentleman, I said, we don't have any photographs of that. I have a couple pictures from when I was a kid. Oh, it'd be amazing, we'd love to. And he said, well, you know, everyone I go to church with was a tenant farmer. And I said, well, could we come to church? And he said, yeah, no one has ever asked us what it was like growing up. So hopefully in October, we're going and lining up all these groups that are all in their late 70s through their 90s who grew up as tenant farmers. And also one of the things that we want to try to do is find, and speaking of Louisiana, this is, you know, all, all been things in Louisiana, is to try to find buildings that still exist that were tied to events that directly related to tenant farming. So unfortunately, we have this whole history in the state of Louisiana that 
most people don't want to talk about. And these all were directly related to tenant farmers. So are any of these structures still around that we can tie back to these events? We would love to find them so that we can help tell these events that have, for the most part, been forgotten or sort of you know, put under the rug. Um, but we want to tell these stories of, the, of what happened and link them back to the tenant farmers and why this happened and what it had to do with the labor movements at the time. And then, of course, sharing it. Um, so if you go to that, that's our, the videos that we have already um, and the ones that we'll be adding. But we want people to share it around so more people hear about it. And then more people, that's how we find people to tell us about structures and to tell us people who that they know. Or maybe they have a photograph of where a tenant farming house was or a story about it. Even if the building's not there anymore, we still want to hear people's stories. If you can all join me in thanking Jason, thank you so much. Jason mentioned the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and we are an official partner with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And so I would encourage everyone to, to follow them as well. He mentioned some different entities, and there are different arms and subsidiaries and sister organizations that have various grants available um, for uh, different um, initiatives regarding uh, black history in our country. Um, and I would like to say uh, Brent Legs is the executive director of the National Trust African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. And he just came out with a new article. And I, I'm just going to read one snippet from it. Um, I encourage you all to follow the National Trust and, and really follow the work that they're doing. But um, he says, African Americans have always been dreamers of democracy, and it is imperative now more than ever that we preserve and honor these places imbued with black humanity. This is our opportunity to value the lessons African American sites teach us that are all more important at this moment in history. Join us in honoring and telling the full American story. So I want to re reiterate those words as we commit to continuing to do the work that we do to tell the full narrative of all American Black friends. So um, this was a really wonderful presentation. Jason, thank you for the work NCPTT does, and um, to the National Trust as well, and the National Park Service. And um, may we all continue to do this great work and support each other. So thank you so much.